as EIS officers, we are ready to receive the call that it's time to respond to an outbreak. And for me, this call actually happened on my very first day at work. <laughs> as the officer assigned to Los Angeles County, I walked into the door. I was told to cancel all of my meetings. There's been an outbreak of wound botulism. And just a few days later, I found myself sitting in the front seat of a police vehicle, learning how to operate the radio and where to hide in case we were shot at because just a few weeks prior, there was an officer-related shooting. In order for me to tell you this story, I have to start with the question of what is wound botulism? And when people hear the word botulism, they tend to think of contaminated food in cans or improper jars. What you're looking at here is a picture of the bacteria that causes botulism. And I particularly love this picture because you'll notice that there's two separate forms. There's a bowling pin shape, and this is the spore of the bacteria. This is everywhere in the environment. You've eaten and swallowed this before. It is typically inert. Under certain conditions, if the oxygen levels are very low, if it's very low acid levels, they then mature into the long rod shape form. And these are the mature form of the bacteria that then can produce disease through the production of these toxins. And it's one of the toxins that are known to be one of the most toxic known to man. In wound botulism, the same process that's happening in a can is happening inside the human body. So if a little bit of the bacteria is injected into a space that has really low oxygen, low acidity, the bacteria starts to thrive, it starts to produce the toxins, and causes disease. And one of the biggest risk factors for causing wound botulism is heroin use. And on the East Coast, heroin is primarily this, um, is this white purified powder, and that's a predominant form that's found. On the West Coast, there's something called black tar heroin, and this is a lot more common on the West side. The heroin has been mixed with other adulterants and other contaminants, and it's much more likely for you to find the bacteria in black tar heroin than on the purified form of heroin found on the East Coast. Once the disease kicks in, it's a devastating, horrible illness. There's a descending paralysis that occurs, People um, are put on breathing machines. The mortality rate can be as high as 15%, depending on the study. And if you survive, the recovery can take months to years. It can be a huge load on your local health system. The only treatment that we have is botulinum antitoxin, which it surprises me every time I say this, but to this day, it's still made from horses. So it is a very precious, very scant, very expensive resource. So whenever there's outbreaks of wound botulism that occur, those of us in public health become very concerned. Let me tell you about what happened last summer. What you're looking at is a map of Los Angeles County. The green area is the county itself, the gray area is downtown, and each individual cube is one case of wound botulism. This is starting from March in 2018. Normally in Los Angeles County, we only have two to three cases per year, and at this point in July, there's already been four. And over the course of a single weekend, there were three cases in the exact same region. So at this point, we were pretty concerned that the local heroin supply might be contaminated and we were looking at a greater outbreak. So we had a huge conundrum because we can't issue recalls of heroin. <laughs> and there weren't any um, you know, exchange programs in the area either. So it wasn't immediately clear what our response should be. And we discovered we can develop messages to spread, but how would we actually reach these people? So it became obvious to us in Los Angeles County very early on that we needed to work with partners. So two were a little bit more obvious. The first is a local nonprofit dealing with homelessness, uh, people experiencing homelessness, and the other was a mental health services group. And we wanted to make sure that we can connect everyone who might be affected with this outbreak, who are at risk for developing botulism, that they can be connected to the services that they need to treat the addiction that they had. The fourth partner was the most controversial, and this is a local police department. And we had so many conversations about the fact that we were dealing with this incredibly vulnerable population who were partaking in illegal substances. So how can we possibly work with the same group of people who are in, responsible for enforcing those laws to help deal with the outbreak? And it took me a few weeks to realize that I think a lot of these conceptions of police that we had, and a lot of this hesitancy, was really rooted in our perceptions of policing that probably come more from Hollywood or television than reality. 
I had always imagined that if police knew where illegal substances were being sold, that they would just kind of swoop in and arrest everyone and save the day, because that's what we've been taught in the TV shows. The reality is a lot more complicated. Let me take you to the very first day of the outreach. There's myself, our local police officer, and then two public health nurses, as well as two community uh, social workers, uh, community health workers. And this is how the outreaches would look like. We would drive up on the police vehicle. Our officer, who was trying his best to be as friendly as possible, would say, hey, relax. We have a few nurses. They're here. They just want to talk to you. Would that be OK? We would then pile out of the vehicle and talk with the folks about the messaging. Um, and provide counseling and connect with the resources as much as we were able. And throughout this process, I was really, really surprised at how much the police knew and how they worked. They knew a lot of the community members, often saying hi to people by name. They knew who was using. They knew where they were using. They knew where they were selling. We were able to go to all of the hot spots in the area. And they knew who was selling. I was able to talk to a heroin dealer, and we didn't obviously let on that we knew that he was suspected of dealing in heroin, but those were the kind of conversations that wouldn't have been possible if we didn't have the police involved. We performed an evaluation along the way. In this map of the region, each individual blue cube is, an, is a single person that we spoke to. We talked to over 100 individuals, the majority of whom were people experiencing homelessness. Surprisingly, less than 9% refused to talk to us. Um, so the vast majority of people were really engaged. And you'll notice that the map kind of ends abruptly on the eastern border. And this was also based off police intelligence that the gang activity changes past a certain point. And the drug of choice changes of heroin to something else. So we were able to really focus in with the limited resources that we had at the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health so that we can make sure that how we were working was as efficient as possible. I want to leave you with three reflections. The first is to consider the power of social networks. And I've talked a lot today about the police's role, but I think one of the most powerful things that they were able to do was really connect us with the community. And one of the things that really stands out in my memory is one of my favorite parts of working on this outbreak was as we were driving away I happened to look back and I saw one of the gentlemen that we were just speaking with. And he was standing there with a stack of his flyers and he was flagging down someone who was biking by, someone who we knew, and he was handing him a flyer to tell him about what was going on. We tried our best to really engage the participants so that we can ask them for their help to spread the word. And we printed as many stacks of those cards as you saw earlier um, to make sure that, and people were asking us for those cards to make sure that they can really hand them out. And this is borne out in other research as well, that when dealing with these most vulnerable populations, sometimes really engaging the community can result in a message that is more effective than coming from more traditional forms of authority, like police, doctors, public health officials. The second reflection I have is that policing in the United States has become highly, highly controversial. And at the same time, there's also more newer community forms of policing that are starting to emerge. And these are forms of, of policing that I wasn't familiar with. And it was really striking to me to hear our kind of potentially intimidating police officer speak really eloquently about how the future of policing might actually look something more like social work. As these community-based models of policing become more popular, there may be more opportunities for those of us in public health to really be engaging. Finally, one of the things that really struck me as, while working on the outbreak was people wanted to talk about botulism, sure. But one of the most frequent questions that we received was this question of, how do I get an ID card? Because without an ID card, it's really hard to get looped into any of the other services that you need to find a warm place to sleep at night or to receive any kind of treatment for your addiction. So as a physician and an anthropologist, I share the view with many of us at CDC that disease is not simply caused by bacteria and viruses. There's a whole host of other factors that are social and cultural that come into play. Things like economic inequalities, poverty, structural violence, 
And once you start drawing arrows between these other causal factors, it becomes very complicated very quickly. There's really complex webs of causality behind any given disease. And I think if we are serious about our hope to control outbreaks, prevent disease, improve health security of this nation, we have to consider working with partners. Because public health requires teamwork. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.